Um, thank you very much for joining. I think it's about time to start. Um, please take your seats. My name is Leon Anavi, uh, and in the next 40 minutes, uh, I will share with you uh, thoughts and some uh, statistics based on our research that I did about uh, voice assistant uh, SDKs for embedded Linux devices. I'm a senior software engineer at Kansuku Group. Uh, this is a company that provides um, services specialized for embedded devices and open source software. Uh, my colleagues and I have experience in projects such as uh, the Octo project, Open Embedded, the Linux kernel, U-Boot, Automotive Grade Linux, Geneva Development Platform, and a lot of projects in the user space. The company is based in California, but we have people all around the world. I'm uh, working remotely from uh, Plovdiv, Bulgaria. The agenda for today includes uh, three topics. The first one is a uh, brief introduction to smart speakers and the opportunities that they have for people like us developers. Uh, I will focus on three SDKs, Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, which are uh, market leaders at the moment, and another not so popular but interesting solution called Mycroft. Uh, it's open source. That's, that's why it's so interesting for me. Uh, last but not least, uh, I have pre-recorded a few uh, videos that I would like to show with you just to demonstrate what you can do and share some ideas how you can get started building your own devices. Their virtual assistants are not something new. We know them from the science fiction, and there are so many uh, products that are actually uh, being developed in the last couple of decades and are working pretty well. Um, but what's in interesting in the past few years is the rise of the smart speakers. And by saying smart speaker, I mean not just a speaker that has a lot of uh, options for communications like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. I'm speaking about smart speakers with integrated um, voice assistant. Uh, do you own such kind of a device? Can you raise your hand if you have one? All right, half of the people. Uh, it's, for me, it's a very interesting technology. I have uh, commercial products uh, from both Amazon and Google in my, uh, in my apartment, two from Alexa, with Alexa, two with uh, Google Assistant. Uh, it's an interesting technology because uh, it's an end consumer device that includes several hot topics. Uh, from an engineering, engineering perspective, of course, the artificial intelligence and the big data, uh, but also application development in terms of developing new skills or action, depending on the terminology, which are basically third-party applications that the smart speaker can execute for you. And of course, for Internet of Things and abandoned devices, because we can start integrating these voice assistants in various devices. Um, Let's have a look at the key ingredients that we need to make a smart speaker. Um, we've already mentioned a few of them, like the artificial intelligence. Uh, we need a wake word detection uh, in order to make sure that the speaker listens to you. You need a wake word. You all know it. It's some, something like Alexa, hey Google, okay Google. We need um, text to speech. So basically, when um, the um, answer from the cloud is returned to the speaker. It should reproduce, reproduce this, um, this answer as speech. And the biggest problem, actually, is the speech to text. You need recognition of the speech after detecting the, the keyword. You need to detect uh, and recognize what's the person saying. Of course, there is a board bring up. This is some bad Linux conference. <laughs> I'm sure you're all familiar with this part. And uh, there are third party applications. A few years ago, I attended a presentation and someone complained that in the IoT, we don't have so many third party applications. Well, here is an opportunity to make some. But actually, this presentation will focus on the SDK for SDKs for device creation, not the third party applications. Uh, the smart speaker market is huge, uh, it's, and it's, uh, the expectation is that it's going to be bigger and bigger. Uh, keep in mind that at the moment, all the commercial solutions available on the market have limitations of, in the number of uh, languages that are supported. Um, here are some data that I've, uh, I got from this website. 
uh, at the moment, it's clearly that Amazon and Google are the market leaders. Uh, here, here is um, how, how are the sales of smart speakers uh, per country. Of course, this, this depends on the supported languages. We will start the overview with Amazon Alexa uh, because it is the first technology of this kind on the market and in alphabetical order, it's also the first. <laughs> um, how many of you are using Amazon devices? All right, thank you. So Amazon Alexa, just a brief introduction. It's a virtual assistant powered by artificial intelligence uh, developed by Amazon. Uh, it's available as a, as a commercial software for uh, Fire OS, iOS, and Android. Uh, it powers uh, the Amazon devices, the smart speakers, and not only provided by Amazon. It was initially released uh, four years ago. Uh, and it requires uh, the Amazon application, Alexa application installed on a smartphone. They support Android and iOS to get things configured. And to, if, you, if you buy a, a their device, you need the app to, to set up the speaker. Key features, of course, support of several languages. Uh, it supports a list of wake words, uh, but it's a predefined list, so you have some options, but just a few. Uh, there's a voice profile for personal, personalized experience. There are these interesting uh, new features like Alexa to Alexa calling if you have several devices in different rooms and you would like to call a family member through Alexa instead of going to him. Uh, there, there, are, there are options even for making uh, landline calls in the US, Canada, and Mexico. There are two types of developer opportunities. The first one is to make your own devices integrating the Alexa SDK and the other one is to create third-party application uh, that you can publish in a store. Uh, I think it's pretty similar to what we are familiar with in the, mobile wor in the world of uh, mobile applications. Uh, the terminology of Amazon is that these uh, applications are called skills, and basically these are applications without user inter uh, graphical user interface. The user interaction is through, through voice. Um, here is a list of some of the um, Amazon devices released, released on the market. Uh, here, this is uh, the second generation of um, Amazon Echo Dot. This is the most affordable one. Uh, they recently um, made a, a, a modification, uh, another version. And there are a lot of third-party uh, devices with Alexa. Uh, a lot of, uh, as you can see, most of these companies are well-known. They have integrated the SDK with, that provides Alexa as part of their end consumer devices. Um, I did a Google research to find out uh, tear down um, uh, articles to see what's inside these speakers, these commercially available speakers um, sold by Amazon. So uh, this information is about the first generation of Echo and Echo Dot. Uh, you can see that um, the hardware is uh, it's a typical embedded device with uh, um, inter uh, four gigabytes internal memory, uh, Texas Instruments uh, system on a chip, and uh, 256 megabytes. So um, let's have a look um, at the um, Alexa voice services and the SDK. Basically, this is what you need in order to put Alexa into a device. How many of you have used it? Anyone? All right, just two people, all right. Okay, uh, so this, uh, this presentation, uh, I have a lot of slides, I'm, I'll run through all of them. I just try to provide an overview to, to give you the hints. Uh, the things that I'm showing here are based on the public information. Keep in mind that both Alexa and Google that we were reviewing are black box projects. They're not very open source, although certain parts are open source. Um, so the information that you see here is also available in their documentation. Uh, they have pretty good documentation. So the SDK is uh, easy to use, um, and uh, it enables um, prototypers, makers, and um, commercial manufacturers to integrate the Alexa voice service within their devices. The SDK itself is open source. It's available in GitHub under Apache 2.0 license. Um, as of um, the moment, or a week ago, there were 69 commits, uh, 24 releases, and 23 contributors. This is just for the SDK that is um, in GitHub. Um, it's, uh, C++, it's written in C++. It's compatible with Android, Mac OS, Windows, 
uh, and of course, uh, GNU Linux distributions such as Ubuntu and Raspbian. Um, this is how it works. Uh, this is taken directly from uh, the documentation in GitHub. Uh, so it's, um, there are some third-party binaries, and the other is a source that you have to build. Uh, what's interesting is uh, here, this is how you detect the wake word. As I've already mentioned, um, Alexa supports several wake words, so instead of saying Alexa, you can say computer or uh, another of the predefined wake, uh, wake words. And at the end, it goes to the cloud where the heavy lifting is done. Um, so just um, the steps that you need to get this running on a Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi is the 35 US dollar computer. I, I assume everyone of you has it. Who, who has a Raspberry Pi, actually? OK, perfect. Uh, I made a few examples with Raspberry Pi just because it's so popular in the maker community, and I really love it. <laughs> Uh, so the steps are straightforward. You have to assemble the Raspberry Pi with a speaker and a mic. Uh, it's, it's obvious. Uh, you have to install the, the Raspbian OS distribution. Raspbian is a Debian-based distribution provided by the, Raspbian, uh, by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, after that, you have to, um, to download the um, Alexa, uh, Alexa device SDK um, to input your uh, credentials to build it on the target, on the Raspberry Pi, to get refresh uh, tokens and to run the sample applications. Uh, this, is, uh, this URL provides you the exact steps. You can follow it. Of course, there are um, a lot of third-party um, developer kits that you can buy that are optimized for using uh, the SDK on them. There are, uh, they, there are different manufacturers, primarily ARM and Intel. Um, while I was doing the research, I saw that some people have uh, reported successfully building uh, the SDK on MIPS, but I'm not exactly sure how well it works. Um, keep in mind that if you, if you want to make um, a commercial device that you would like to, uh, to sell or the company that you work for would like to sell, uh, there, is, there are some certifications. Um, you have to agree to Amazon uh, terms and agreements. Um, you have to go through product testing before uh, going to the market. So pretty much if you're developing a, a device, you have to, uh, you depend on, uh, on Amazon. Now, let's move to the next one. This is Google Assistant. Uh, again, how many of you are using Google Assistant, the alternative? I have both Alexa and uh, Google Assistant. So, okay, a little bit more here than Alexa, I think. Uh, so it's, it has the same purpose, uh, but it's developed by Google. It's a virtual assistant with um, uh, uh, voice commands. Uh, it's available for numerous uh, platform, uh, including um, mobile and smart home devices. Uh, it was initially released a couple of years ago, so it's newer compared to uh, Amazon Alexa. Um, the SDK is, uh, is uh, written in C++. Uh, no, actually. Uh, so, sorry, this is a mistake. Um, it, it requires, um, it requires the, the Google Home application installed on your smartphone. It's pretty much the same uh, workflow as for um, Amazon to set up um, a device that comes with Google Assistant. So the features, again, it supports multiple languages. Uh, there are several different voice options, so uh, you can select uh, which voice you prefer and use it. Uh, it also he has a voice match which allows uh, the uh, Google Assistant to uh, recognize you or your family members and to provide you personalized information depending on who's talking to the Google Assistant. Uh, there is this new feature called Google Duplex. Uh, you probably have seen the, you, have, you probably have seen the, the video that they uh, presented in May. It's, uh, it's very exciting because Basically, the, the demonstration was that a person uh, asked Google Assistant to schedule an appointment at a restaurant or a, 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 a cosmetic saloon, and Google Assistant did it for it. Uh, but of course, all these features are uh, proprietary. They're not open source, so I cannot uh, talk too much about them because I'm not involved in any way in the development of them. So the developer opportunities here are the same as for Alexa. It's pretty much an ecosystem, and this is the ecosystem of Google. Um, 
there is an opportunity to create embedded devices with the Google Assistant, and there is an opportunity to create this third-party application that you can publish, again, without graphical user interface, but with voice interaction. The difference is that uh, unlike SKUs, which is the term used by Alexa, Google decided to use actions. But it's pretty much the same idea. Um, once again, I'm just reminding that we will not focus on the skills and actions in this presentation. So this is the SDK that we need uh, in order to integrate Google Assistant in our device. Uh, Google is providing a turnkey solution that's written in, uh, in Python, really easy to install it. It's compatible with ARMv7 or Intel x86-64 devices. Uh, there is also a Google Assistant service uh, that works over uh, RPC communication. This is a comparison that you can find on their page um, to see uh, the differences between the library and the service. The examples that uh, we will discuss here are based on the library. Of course, there are uh, Google sm Smart Home speakers. Smart, uh, Google Home is um, the brand name. Uh, Mini is, uh, this is uh, Google Home Mini. This is the most affordable uh, smart speaker um, on, on the market. You can find it pretty much the same price as Alexa, um, Echo Dot. They also recently released, uh, this was released in the beginning of this month, Google Home Hub, which is a device with, uh, with a display. So it's some kind of a smart speaker, smart speaker with graphical user interface. Um, that can show you additional information and um, provide a, user, a graphical user interface to control the other internet thing, of things integrated with uh, Google Assistant in your home. There is a long list of devices of big companies that have already created um, um, third-party devices in, uh, with um, Google Assistant, uh, like Panasonic, Sony. Uh, a lot of companies are interested in this field and they're making devices. Again, I've uh, Googled uh, to see what's inside the smart speakers provided by Google. As you can see, the, the specifications are not so different from what we saw uh, for, um, uh, for uh, um, Amazon devices. We, again, we have ARM systems on the chip. Uh, these are from Armada. Um, well, it has a little bit more RAM compared to, um, to the Amazon devices. Um, I couldn't find uh, the exact amount of RAM um, in internal storage for uh, Google Home Max. Google Home Max is the high-end um, speaker that has a very good sound capabilities. So now in a few steps, I would like to share with you what we did uh, for Alexa, uh, how we can integrate Google Assistant in a device. Uh, there are a few options uh, to, to build such a device. In the showcases, I'll share a bit more information, but. The first one is uh, the Google Voice Kit for Raspberry Pi. Uh, this was something that was distributed with the MacPy magazine um, a year ago, and they, they have a second release now. Uh, it's the easiest way to get started because it's a cardboard box for Raspberry Pi with an uh, add-on board with a head that you plug on, on top of your Raspberry Pi with a, with, a, with a mic, a speaker, and a button. You can uh, activate Google by pressing the button. Uh, there is also an option if you, if you want to get your hands a little bit dirty and to do some soldering, you can build your own head for Raspberry Pi using these components uh, from Adafruit. You can also do it with, um, with a breadboard. In the showcase, I'll, I'll show you how it looks if you do it, do it this way. There are, there are a lot of wires. Th these are options for quick and dirty prototyping with low-cost budget for makers. Um, and of course, we have Orange Pi. Orange Pi is dirt cheap, so it's a, it's a good option to, to make a prototype for a low budget. Uh, there is Orange Pi uh, Zero Set 6, which includes the Orange Pi with a case and an expansion board that brings a mic. Uh, you also need to plug a speaker uh, to make this demo. The, the steps require uh, working with the uh, Google Platform Console uh, to enable the, the Google API. Um, after that, you need to install the SDK on the device uh, for this particular tutorial has been tested on uh, uh, Orange Pi Zero. We, I was using Armbian. Armbian is a, is a Debian-based uh, distribution optimized for uh, ARM devices, as the name suggests, and particularly for uh, ARM devices with OWNR systems on a chip. 
So these are the steps. Uh, they're pretty, pretty much straightforward. Uh, you need to install Python because the SDK of Google is written in Python. After that, you have to install the SDK itself. And uh, finally, to start the Google Assistant demo. Uh, in order to make things a little bit simpler, uh, if you want this device to be dedicated for, uh, for this purpose, uh, you need to create a system this service uh, to make sure that um, the, 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 the uh, the SDK started automatically at boot of the, the device. This is something that I wrote. I'm just sharing it. It's, if you're familiar with systemd, nothing, nothing interesting here. Uh, and after that, you need to, after writing the uh, systemd service, you have to enable it at launch. Keep in mind that if you want to make something more serious, not just a prototype with a low cost hardware like the, the, the thing that I showed you, you need uh, again to apply for certification by Google. So again, you are dependent on Google and releasing a third party um, device that uses the Google Assistant uh, is pretty much, it depends on this corporation making the software. And uh, here we come to the third option, which is called Mycroft. Uh, the interesting thing about Mycroft is that it is entirely open source project uh, for a voice assistant again. Um, the idea is straightforward, something that's open source and it's capable to uh, compete with uh, Amazon Alexa or a Google Assistant. Um, are you familiar, how many of you have heard about Mycroft? Okay, great. And how many of you have uh, Microsoft devices that are uh, that were distributed. Okay, a few people. That's great. So a few words about Microsoft. I'll spend a little bit more time on Microsoft because it's open source and in my opinion it's quite interesting. Uh, everything is in GitHub. They have a GitHub repository for the company. Um, the open source license uh, for the software is Apache 2.0, and the hardware is also open source, and they have certified the, the hardware, the Mark I, this is the, the, the commercial name of their first product that was crowdfunded uh, through Kickstarter in Indiegogo. Um, um, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's, um, it's uh, again available at GitHub. It has been certified by the Open Source Hardware Association, uh, just a few words about this because I'm, I'm, I'm personally an open source, hardware, um, open source hardware enthusiast. This association checks that really the product is open source uh, hardware and it's compliant with their, um, uh, with their expectations. Uh, the certification is free, so Microsoft uh, passed these certifications. It's a US company, so the UID for the open source hardware starts with US, this is the number. Uh, Microsoft is a company, they're um, a startup company. As I've already mentioned, uh, they started with crowdfunding campaigns um, through Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Uh, currently, they're seeking for investments as well uh, through another um, uh, web platform called Start Engine. Uh, so since this is, a, this is an open source project, I would like to make an overview of the pools of the project since all repositories in GitHub and we can have a look at the statistics. Um, so the majority of the software is written in Python. Uh, My Microsoft Core is the core component, uh, the, the artificial intelligence uh, on which Microsoft relies. Um, there are almost 3,000 commits. Uh, these these uh, statistics were taken a few days ago, so they might be outdated already. Um, there are eight contributors with more than 100 commits. Uh, this is interesting for me because you know how open source works, and there are a lot of... Um, projects that are very dependent on the authors. Uh, it's good to see that there are quite a lot of people contributing to this thing and they are cont contributing continuously. Uh, there is a SKUs repository. These are the third party applications uh, like the, the ones that we discussed for um, um, Amazon and uh, for Amazon Alexa and for Google Assistant. Um, here is a list of third party SKUs that have been already developed. And in this repository, we, we also have uh, quite a lot of contributors. Here, the number is bigger because people are listing their skills. Um, so the features in Micro, uh, Microsoft. It's, uh, uh, the moment, it's officially available only in English, but um, they're trying to translate it to, to different languages. And actually, this is uh, where we can help. Uh, we can help them by starting to translate. So far, I have zero contributions to Microsoft. 
Uh, I just wanted to make sure that um, I'm not dependent when I'm uh, providing this talk. Uh, but uh, one of the things in my to-do list for fun is to start contributing and the translations is the easiest way to, to help. Um, so um, it supports extensions for uh, functionality by developing um, software applications called SKUs. Um, it's, uh, there's a Microsoft SKU Manager, MSM, and a repository that we've already mentioned. Um, there is an optional device and account management in the cloud uh, called Microsoft Home. Uh, the good thing is that uh, there, there is an option to use the device without home. Um, one of the things that um, is um, of great concern of uh, people, especially people like us that are engineers, is privacy. Uh, how many of you have concerns about the privacy when they're using something like this with things in the cloud? Okay, I think we have like 100% here. <laughs> uh, so um, a lot of friends ask me, okay, that's, that's super, that's uh, so cool to have something like this, but can we run it entirely in-house uh, to be completely independent from the cloud, from internet? And um, so the answer is that Microsoft is, uh, according to my research, it's, it's, it cannot run without internet connectivity, the, the biggest problem is the, the speech uh, to text recognition, but uh, uh, most of the components are open source, and according to the documentation, to their forums, their press releases, they're working in that direction. So in the next few slides, we will review the components in Mycroft. The first one is the, the wake words. Um, the default wake words are, hey, Mycroft, but since this is an open source project, there, there is a way to change them to whatever you need. And this could be even um, a, good, a good opportunity if you need to integ integrate artificial intelligence with, uh, with voice, uh, voice commands in business-to-business uh, -business solutions. Because if you are um, putting this in a hotel or so something like this, you might need to change the keyword to something that matches the, the business model of the company that you are working for. Um, precise is the, the uh, default wake-up word uh, listener. It has been introduced this spring in March. Uh, it's written in Python. It's available at uh, the GitHub repositories of Mycroft. Before that, they were using uh, Pocket Sphinx. And it, Pocket Sphinx is uh, still available uh, to, to be used in Microsoft, uh, Mycroft as an alternative, but precise is the default at the moment. Uh, here comes the, the biggest challenge for open source solution is the speech to text uh, engines. Um, Microsoft supports um, a number of these um, speech to text engines. The default one is Google. So that's why at the moment you cannot run uh, Microsoft uh, in house uh, without internet connection because it needs um, connection to Google, but uh, there, there's a nice post on their website. You can have a look at the technical details there. They're explaining the measures that they have taken in order to uh, guarantee anonymity and uh, uh, to resolve pri privacy concerns. Uh, there, there, there are also a couple of other proprietary uh, solutions that they, uh, they offer and you can select, but what's interesting is deep speech. Uh, this is a new project that I have been developing with um, with Mozilla. It's an uh, open source um, speech-to-text engine. Uh, it's available at GitHub uh, under Mozilla pub public license. Uh, it's written in uh, several languages, C++, Python, and of course, shell scripts. Uh, it look, uh, it um, uses uh, TensorFlow to simplify the implementation. It's, uh, it's been heavily developed, but, uh, but um, uh, it's still not the default. Uh, speech to text engine in Microsoft. I'm not sure what is the state. I didn't have it enough time to, to, to go deeper in my research and to see how useful is this. Uh, the problem with the speech uh, to text recognitions is that the accuracy. If you have like 80% accuracy, th this is not enough because if you say, uh, hey, Microsoft, turn on the lights and instead of lights, it here right it doesn't make sense. It won't execute the command that you need. So the text-to-speech engines here, uh, the, the situation is better. Um, they have an open source uh, solution. It's called Mimic, as well as a bunch of other, um, other uh, solutions that are available. 
Uh, Mimic is a fast, lightweight text-to-speech engine. Uh, it's been developed by uh, My uh, Mycroft and Vocali, uh, Vocali D. Um, it's, um, it's based on another software. It's available in GitHub. It's written in C. Uh, it, it works on several, several platforms, including, of course, Linux, uh, Mac OS, and Windows. Microsoft, uh, Microsoft uh, have uh, uh, released uh, a couple of devices uh, through crowdfunding campaigns. Um, it's important to say that they've managed to ship uh, the first one. It took, it took them some time. It's very difficult to, to make a crowdfunding campaign for something that complex and to deliver it. It's great that they have done it. Uh, they had a new crowdfunding campaign for the Mark II. It's, uh, as far as I remember, it's expected to, to be shipped in December. And of course, there is the option to make your own device using Raspberry Pi. The greatest thing about Raspberry Pi is that with this 35 US dollar computer, you can try all the platforms that we are reviewing here today. Uh, for, for the moment, um, according to the information that I read on their website, Microsoft supports Raspberry Pi 2 and 3B, and there is work in progress for 3B+. Uh, they have a distribution which is based on Raspbian, which is based on Debian. Uh, the name of the distribution is PyCroft. So, um, we have a few minutes for showcases, and after that we've got two mics here so we can have a discussion. Let's start with the Google Voice Kit. Um, I'm starting with it because it's particularly impressive the, the way how they're using a cardboard box to, to, to make the speaker. Uh, it's a do-it-yourself do um, kit that takes approximately between one and two hours to assemble and to get it working. There are two versions. The first, the first version was distributed with the MacPie magazine, and now they have a second version that was released this year. The first version was from a year ago. Uh, I have a half couple of the first versions. Th this is how it looks. And when you assemble it, uh, this is what you get. The first version was distributed without a Raspberry Pi, so everything else was included here in the box. Uh, if you are feeling more adventurous, you can do something like this. Um, it's, um, the photo isn't perfect because there are too many cables, but this is breadboard port, uh, prototyping with, um, with Adafruit um, um, add-on boards. The first one is a microphone. There are two microphones for a stereo effect. Um, this is uh, especially if you're using uh, uh, Google Assistant SDK, this is a great advantage. And this is a Class D, uh, very simple amplifier that allows you to connect a small speaker. And uh, I've already mentioned Orange Pi Zero. This is uh, the third showcase, uh, another great device for makers. Uh, th the price is approximately, I think, 20, 25 US dollars. I might be wrong, but it's uh, very, very cheap. And it's something that you uh, get a, as a whole kit. Um, you, you still need to add, a, uh, add your own speaker, but the case and the expansion boards are including into this uh, set. Unfortunately, Orange Pi is not open source hardware, but at least it's cheap. There is uh, excellent Armbian support. Uh, Armbian provides both mainline kernel versions, uh, uh, distributions with mainline kernel and with um, the notorious version uh, kernel 3.4 for uh, owner devices, no, also known as uh, Linux Sunxi. Um, I would like to, sh to show you a video here. Just a second. Uh, okay. okay, Google. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. What can I help you with? Okay, Google. What is my name? Your name is Leon. Okay, Google. What is the weather forecast? In Plovdiv today, there will be showers with a forecast high of 23 and a low of 11 degrees Celsius. Okay, Google, thank you very much. No problem. Uh, this is a demonstration that I recorded at home. I didn't want to take uh, too many risks bringing it here. 
uh, because it requires internet connection, uh, following the steps that I've already showed you uh, during the presentation for Google Assistant, I have integrated it on Orange Pi. Um, there was a little bit of annoying background noise. It's because of the uh, chief speaker that I was using. Um, so a few words uh, for Home Assistant. I, um, I really enjoy this open source um, platform for home automation. You can integrate a lot of things. You can also integrate um, Alexa. There is a, specifically for Alexa, there is an excellent support. And there is a one backdoor that allows you to configure a, uh, a Home Assistant to use, uh, to represent itself as Philips Hue. And since Alexa is having a built-in Philips Hue support, uh, you can turn on and off all the devices that you have at home. This is something that I've uh, already presented at FOSDEM at the beginning of the year, but I would like to reuse uh, the demo to show you how you can turn on and off um, um, a device. Actually, it's a head on top of Raspberry Pi. On the Raspberry Pi, we have the Home Assistant running. Another video. Uh, this is the user interface of uh, Home Assistant. It's a free and open source software. This is the Alexa and this is the Raspberry Pi. The Home Assistant is running here. And uh, I'm using Imputity to com communicate between all these things. Oh. Alexa. Okay. Hi. Hi there. Alexa, turn on Anavi Light Fat. Okay. Alexa, turn off Anavi Light Fat. Okay. I'm trying to be polite with these things because one day they might rule the, the world and I want to survive. So this is how it works. Um, we have an Qtd broker for this particular setup. Um, we're a little bit ahead of time, so let's go to the uh, conclusions. Um, there are just, um, just a few things that I would like you to remember from this presentation. As I said, it was not a deep dive into any of these technologies, but um, based on what I see, there is a huge demand on the, on the market for this type of devices. There are a lot of opportunities for integration of um, Internet of Things and embedded devices uh, in them in uh, different terms, uh, like third-party applications like SKUs, or uh, like integrating the voice assistant within um, devices such as con uh, consumer electronic devices such as TVs, refrigerators, or even toasters, who knows. Uh, at the moment, the market leaders are uh, definitely Amazon and Google. They provide turnkey solutions if you would like to try it out on a maker device such as the Raspberry Pi. But if you want to make a commercial device, you need to go through a certification. The open source alternative right now is Mycroft. Um, it's a very interesting uh, project, uh, definitely tough to compete on the market with uh, huge corporations like Amazon and Google. Unfortunately, in practice at the moment, um, all reviewed solutions here require access to the internet and to the cloud to work successfully. Thank you very much. These are a few uh, useful uh, links, including some uh, uh, links in YouTube uh, for uh, more presentations. Uh, right after the talk, I'll uh, upload the latest version uh, of the slides uh, to SlideShare. Thank you very much, and you have the mic for questions. <laughs> Any questions? Oh. So you showed two demos. One with uh, one was with Alexa, and the second one with, was with Google Assistant. But have you tried Mycroft? Um, I haven't. Um, I haven't recorded a video with Mycroft. Uh, but yes, there is um, this Pycroft image that allows you to very quickly turn it on on Raspberry Pi. Yeah, my general doubt is if is it working or not. Uh, yeah, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> it's working. Yeah. Yes. So yes. It's, uh, the, it's, the quality is good enough that you can build something on the top of it? Because um, we know that Google Assistant works, yeah? So it's easy to deploy what, something what, what, on what it. What do you Could, mean when you say something, like a commercial device? Not a commercial device, but own project, let's say. Yes, for, I mean for, the, for hobbyists, it's good enough, yes. Okay, that's fine. For commercial 
for commercial devices, you need to, to spend more efforts on it. Yes? Okay, uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, if you have evaluated the SDKs for the Google and the Alexa and for Microsoft, do you know what kind of the smallest hardware requirements do they allow? So the Raspberry Pi is, well, it's a small computer, but it's quite a formidable computer after all. So can you run any them like on maybe 100 gigabytes, 100 megabytes of RAM, like a 100 megahertz CPU, something like that? That's an excellent question. Um, thank you very much about it. And um, I wanted to show you exact answer in my slides, but I was unable because I didn't, I wasn't able to find anyone listing the minimal system requirements as they do for playing games or something like this. Uh, for uh, 100 megabytes of uh, RAM, I'm pretty sure it's not possible. Uh, we can go back to the slides where we had this um, teardown of uh, specifications of the commercial device available out there. Uh, here is the one for. Yeah, uh, sorry to interrupt. Is this right that the Google Home Mini has like four jigs? It, is this true? Uh, well, I'm not sure if it's in all uh, in in all devices, but yeah, this is what I saw in uh, uh, in the teardown. And um, actually, I have at home I have both Google Home and Home Mini. And I have the impression that the Google Home Mini is a little bit faster, but I might be wrong because I already saw this and, <laughs> and I, was, um, I didn't have the courage to tear down my own Google Home Mini. <laughs> I think it's an irreversible pr uh, process if you tear it down once. Uh, uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe one last question about the, uh, I mean, like, in the near future, how do you think, if it will be possible to run all this stuff like locally on the device, uh, it should be like a bit more powerful, quite a bit more powerful, because you need to run, run text-to-speech, all the uh, intelligent AI stuff, all the thing, everything like that. What, do you, what would we need to do to make it happen? Like maybe some kind of uh, AI-specific uh, chip like an Apple does or something like that. Do you know if there is some progress in that direction? Uh, that's uh, an excellent question again, and that's totally true. If you want to run everything in-house on the device without relying on the cloud, uh, this would require a lot more computation of power. Um, I know that there are a lot of companies um, making uh, chips uh, uh, specifically for this purposes, but uh, I'm not familiar with details of any of these chips, so I cannot give any recommendations. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, too. Um, is there other questions? Are, are there other questions? Um, hello. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, so the Google Home Mini has 512 uh, megs of RAM, actually. Uh, and uh, current requirements for Google, uh, so it used to be dual core, and it's now they are moving to uh, quad cores as a minimal system requirements. And, uh, the requirement for RAM is uh, 512, and uh, for NAND flash, it's also uh, 512, the minimum requirement for Google products, at least. Okay, thank you very much for uh, this correction, uh, and sorry for uh, not providing very accurate data on, on this particular slide. Um, is, are there any other questions? Thank you for the talk. Uh, as you said, uh, privacy is a major concern, and that's why I don't have uh, Echo or, uh, I mean, or Google devices yet at home, because how can I be sure they're not listening? So, I, of course, if I make my own product, I can guarantee that this, does, this doesn't happen, but what is your perspective on this? Like, uh, how can you make sure that Amazon and Google are not listening to what you say at home? Um, yeah, it's an excellent question. I think uh, this is a problem for pretty much all of us. Uh, and, uh, well, with a corporation, you can just trust them unless it's open source. So for me, my personal opinion is that I would like to see something open source succeeding, whether it's Mycroft or something else. But um, based on the research that I did and the, the things that I shared with you, I'm 
pretty optimistic about uh, Mycroft. Of course, it's another, uh, another question whether the business model would be good enough and sustainable to, to, to survive in this, uh, this market. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for joining.